Welcome to Thursday of week four. We're making good time, which means that students need to slow me down and ask more questions. So we've gone through all of shape shifting in the first part of class, everything about changing one number. Today, we're gonna to take another chunk out of mad science, squishing numbers together, see what comes out. We've done everything about fractions. And we've done most of percentages. We're going to review percent change, talk about the one plus trick, and then start the measurement part of squishing numbers together with unit analysis. And unit analysis is like riding a bicycle. It seems sort of overwhelming the first day you try it. Once you get used to it, then it flows quite nicely and you don't have to tax your brain to do it. So, of all of the topics that we do, unit analysis is one of the most helpful in real life. And it's also one that you just have to spend enough time doing homework to get to that point where yes, riding a bicycle works for me. Um, it is now something that my brain is used to and not a big deal anymore. So that's our goal. If you don't slow me down enough today with questions, then I'll get into some polygon and circle stuff, but. That's probably better if you slow me down and we don't get to that till next week. So to review, we talked about percent change and there were some issues with percent change of is the decrease given to you or do you have to do some subtraction before you really get started? You had, it was just change divided by original would give you the percent change change divided by original produces a decimal, use ripple up to scoot the decimal point twice and make the percent that you were asked to make. Then we talked about problems that were percent of problems, uh, actually earlier than that, where what is 20% of 25, things like that. And for that, the question was at the end, did they want you to combine it with the original number or not. So I'm going to take that decision tree and stick it on the jam board and we'll call it review of percent change and percent of. that paper so it's not too crowded. Okay. So let's do four problems because there's four things in this picture, two of them hiding here and two of them hiding there. So the first would be a percent change where it shows the number. It shows you what the change is. So that's a problem with something like, um, I don't know, a phone is on sale. For $20 off. It normally costs $150. What is the discount as a percent? So I take that formula, percent change is change divided by original. Okay. 
the change is 20, it just tells me that. The original is 150, it tells me that. My calculator, 20 divided by 150 is what? 0.133333. Then I use Riplop. Go right to get into percent. And I get about 13%. Okay, questions about that one? None here, thank you. Okay, so somebody, one of you or together, some of you, your turn. Now we're going to do a percent change, but it hides the change. So maybe a house price goes from an $80,000 house to 105000 What's the percent of the change? How would I do that one? I'll be your scribe, you tell me what to write. You subtract the 80,000 from the 105 to find the change, yes. I think. Exactly. So the okay. change is $105,000 minus $80,000. So 80 plus 20 is 100. It's going to be 5,000 more than that. So 25,000. Okay, then what? I said you divide the change to the original price? Yes. So the change we just found, which one of these is the original number? 80,000? Yeah. Avoid the trap. Don't always pick the biggest or the smallest, right? Think about what's really happening in the situation. So 25 divided by 80. 0.3125. Am I too close to the bottom of the screen? No, I can see it. And, and again, there's some rip -wop happening there. Okay, good job. So that was the two cases here. The problem asks for the percentage. And then did it show me the change as a number or did it hide the change as a number? Now we're going to, on the next slide, do these. So we'll do percent of problems. And it asks for the change not as a percent, but as a plain number. And does it, do we want to combine it or not? So we'll start with no combining. So we've done a house price, we've done a, something on sale. 
Um, let's find a tip. So, what is a 15% tip? on a $20 meal. So we're asking what is 15% of 20? The 15%, we translate that to a decimal. Going this time left to get out of percent. The of, we translate that to be multiplying. And the 20 just stays 20. And we're done. We don't combine that three with anything else. The last category is a percent of problem. And it has combining. So a uh, let's call it a retirement fund actually. So someone just sets aside 5,000 for retirement. It goes up 8%. Then what's their new balance? What's in the account after the increase? So I start by doing the same thing. I'm finding 8% of 5,000. The 8%. Rip flop twice, going left out of percent, and I get 0 0.08. The of becomes times. The 5,000 just stays a number. And whatever that is, $400. But I'm not done because it doesn't ask how much did it go up. It asks, what's the new balance? So what's my last step? Add 5,400. Yeah. And I'm going to write it out the long way, even though you probably don't need to. There we go. So that was these two sides. We are given the percent. We do a percent of kind of thing. And is the answer just a number, the change, or do we have to combine it with something else? So that's a review of what we did the last half of last class. Do you want another problem of any of these four types?
I understand it on my own. Okay. Last call. Anyone want another one? I can do another one. Which type? One, two, three, and four. Three, a percent of with no combining. Okay. Let me look at your homework. Um, here is one that might show up on the final. Sales tax is 6% in a certain place. How much is the sales tax for something that costs $565. So if it helps, think about this picture. We're asked for a number, how much tax? Are we gonna combine it with something? No, we're just gonna find the change and stop. So we want 6% of 565. Okay, tell me what's next. Esmeralda's turn to talk, if you can. I don't know if you have too much noise in your background. What was my first step? Uh, you, uh, you put the decimal point. Wait, no. Uh, what? Uh, uh, wait, yes. Yes, you do. Put the decimal point. Hmm. Uh, Take this 6%. The decimal point is sort of hiding there, 6.0. So I scoot it twice to the left because I'm going left out of percent. I'll open it. So that becomes a point zero six. Of becomes times. Numbers stay numbers. And then my calculator does its work. And I get $33.90. This problem could have asked, how much do you pay at the cash register if you add the price and the tax together? But that's not what it did. We just stopped when we get the tax. Okay, thank you for your help. I'm gonna pause for a moment, mark that someone else is here for attendance. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I just got here a little late. No problem, I was a moment late too. There was traffic getting back, traffic accident that slowed me down. Okay, so we had done four different types of percent problems the percent change where it showed or hid the change and percent of where you combined things at the end or you didn't. Now this particular last case where it's percent of and you have combining, there's a shortcut for. So first let's do it without the shortcut. Um, So somebody buys a firearm just to save it and have it go up in value. And it starts at 100 and it goes up 12%. What is the new selling price? So I'm first finding 12% of 100. And as we've done before, this will be 0.12. The of becomes times, numbers stay numbers, and we get $12. If 
but it doesn't ask how much did it appreciate. We have to take the original amount, add on the increase, and what they, what they asked for was this new price, 112. So that was two different steps, things I wrote in green and things I wrote in red. So what if we could do that all in one step? The problem, the reason we have two steps is that my original amount disappeared, right? The hundred dollars went away in my green math. So we could keep it from disappearing. And the way we keep something around is by multiplying it by one, because times one doesn't change something. It gives you the same amount as before. So instead, I'm going to do the same problem. But I'm going to take that $100. And I'm going to multiply it by one to keep the hundred dollars from disappearing and 0.12 because that's the 12% change. So this part here goes there and this part here, the 100, goes there. And if I did that, plug in 100 times 1.12 on my calculator, then I get 112 right away. So we'll do a bunch more of these, but that's the general gist of it. So as far as the lecture notes go, in the previous problem, when we calculated that, the initial amount of 100 was used, but then disappeared, and we had to add it back as a second step. So multiplying by one doesn't change the number. We use that, and we get this one plus trick, which I will put on the Jamboard. When we multiply by a percent increase, we can add one to the percentage, right? All we did was put a one in front of the 0.12 from before. And it keeps the original amount around. So we'll do a bunch of them. A wedding ring worth 5,000 increases in value by 8%. So first I notice that 8%. If I make it a decimal, do I go right or left? We go left. Left, left, out of percent. So I get 0.08%. Because right, there's like an O that fills in this one. But what I don't want to do is 5,000 times just a plain 0.08, because then the 5,000 will disappear and I have to add it back on, and that's extra work, and I'm lazy. So instead, I'm going to say, let's put a one in front, which is really easy to do. Kapow, there it goes. And now when I multiply 5,000 times 1.08, then I get 5,400. Questions about that one?
Okay, notice that I'm writing things a little differently. That's okay. I have kids home too. We started by being very clear that we took the 6% and we were translating it into 0 0.06 and the of was multiply and so on. Then I adjusted a little bit. I got rid of these arrows and then I adjusted a little bit more. I'm not writing that it's 8% of and the of becomes times. We're building on what happened in the previous slides. So hopefully you're getting the sense that we take the original amount and we're multiplying it by the percent. And we use Riplop on the percent, but now we're just putting a number one in front because it's that kind of problem. Okay, let's do another one. A $200 necklace increases in value by 4%. What's the new value of the necklace? Somebody tell me where to start. Sure, I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> Um, you can just go ahead and put down the, the $200 necklace for the value. Okay. I'm going to actually write that over here for reasons. And turn the percentage into a decimal. So 4% going left out of percent do, 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 becomes 0.04. So I'm going to take the 200 and I have the 0.04. And you should go ahead and add a one since it is increasing. Okay. And I'm multiplying and I get 208 in one nice quick step. Okay, questions about the one plus trick? No questions here. Okay, there's two more, a microwave and a rent changing. You can try those, look at the answer on your own after class. There is also a one minus trick, but not everyone likes it. So the one plus trick everyone likes because I could add up two numbers or I could put a one in front. Which of those is easier? Everyone likes to put a one in front. The one minus trick isn't quite so cool a trick. The shortcut is harder than just putting a one in front of the decimal you're using anyway. So some people like it and other people say, nah, it's not worth it. So either way it works. Let's take a example problem. So a bracelet worth 200 goes down in value by 15%. So first I will do this with two steps. I will find 15% of 200. So do, 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 do. left out of percent, 0.15 times 200, well, that's going to be $30. And then as step two, it starts at being worth 200, but it goes down 30 bucks. So I'm left with 170. Good so far?
Anyone need me to talk about this two steps more before I go on? Also quiet. Okay. So the one minus trick is a little longer than the one plus trick. I'm going to do the same kind of thing. Let's take the same problem. And I'm going to take that 200 and write it over here, just like when Joel was talking. And I'm going to multiply it by something. And I'm still going to say that, hey, 15% is 0.15. And I'm still going to use the 0.15. But what I'm going to do for the trick is to say, what is one minus 0.15? So I'm getting 200 times 0.85. What it's saying is that if 15% of the value went away, 85% of the value is left because it has to add up to 100%. And 100 minus 15% minus is 85%. 1 minus 0.15 is 0.85. This one is now like 100%. So 85% remains. And if I did that multiplication, then yes, I would get my 170 right away. So not everyone likes this. Some people say this is just a little complicated, thinking that 85% remains if 15% goes away, doing some rip-lop in my head. So I'm just going to do it the top way. That's clear, I never mess up, it's good. Other people like the one minus trick, it's a little bit faster. So whatever floats your boat. This is one of the many things we've looked at this week where you should be able to follow it on the board. Who knows what your next teacher will do that you need to be able to follow while they're lecturing. Or who knows if the GED will say, here is a math problem. Somebody tried to do it, find their error, and they did it this way. Or who knows if you're working in a study group and the person in your study group likes this and tries to do it this way, but you like the other way or something. So be able to follow both of them, but you only have to do it one way yourself. So pick top or bottom, whichever you like, and do that for the homework. So that's the one line is trick. There's videos and textbook for other things, but not there, because for some reason the textbooks don't teach you this trick. Your homework, if you haven't done it yet, should be even easier, because now you have the trick. And there's random problems if you want more practice. Okay. Should we do more one plus trick or one minus trick? I'm good here. Uh, I would like, can we do one more of the one minus trick? Sure. Should I do top and bottom both ways or do you just want practice following the bottom way? Uh, the bottom way. Bottom, okay. So somebody buys a new car for 22,500. And since new cars depreciate absurdly quickly, especially as soon as it leaves the new car a lot, then its value goes down by 10% in just the first month. So 10%. Going left out of percent is 0.1. 
what I'm going to do with that point one is subtract it from the whole one. So what is one minus point one? For some people, they like writing it. Other people, that part confuses them and they just want to say the opposite of 10% is 90% and do it that way. I'll actually write both. So maybe we're saying that we're going to multiply by one minus the point one. whatever that is, 20,250. And other people will say, I'm just going to do in my head that 100% minus 10% equals 90%. And then I will do my rip-lop on that instead. And that's how I get the 0.9 over here. So two different ways to think about the one minus trick. Did that help enough, Joel? Uh, yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment and see if I can. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Okay, so we are about to switch topics and go on to measurement. Um, but before we do that, I might as well repeat during class and video what I sent out an email announcement on. Um, there's a fellow named Pat McKee that started a textbook company and he is offering a free textbook. It is a little scary because it's a statistics textbook and we're not in a statistics class. On the other hand, it starts out with a bunch of review material that has a lot of overlap with our GED math. So if you want, follow the link I sent out in the email. Just tell, it, tell him where to mail you a copy and he will mail you a free copy. He wants people to test out the idea of a newspaper style textbook because his company sells $50 textbooks, but he can get this even cheaper than that if people like it. So here's the ebook version. And just to show you a little bit, then it looks mostly like a normal textbook, except it's in two columns, like a newspaper. It has all of the QR codes that his company's textbooks always have, where if you were to hold your phone up over it, then there's videos of people doing these things, right? So um, you get your videos, even with the newspaper. It has example problems. 
things like exponents, order of operations, right? So a bunch of stuff that we have done. This just could give you more practice. So if you are interested, ta-da, get a free book. If not, that's okay. Other people can be his test audience, but I thought I should share that. Okay, on to measurement. So we're going to start doing the measurement part of mad science with unit analysis. Unit analysis, as I said earlier, is like riding a bicycle. It starts out very imposing and you feel like you've scraped your knees up. But once you get used to it, it's nice and smooth and fluid and makes your life easier. If you ever want to take a chemistry class, most of intro chemistry is just unit analysis. Unit analysis has a five step process. And if I was to try and read it out loud to you without doing anything, it would make no sense at all. So I am just going to show you an example problem of how many inches are in 3.7 feet. And there's other ways to do this one, but I'm going to use a problem that's kind of easy and we have other ways to do it so that you get this slightly complicated unit analysis problem. And then we will move on to harder problems that you can't do the other ways and see how this works. It even solves those too. So how many inches is 3.7 feet? My first step is to write whatever they give you as a fraction. Maybe they give you a rate, 30 miles per hour, and then you could write 30 miles fraction bar and then underneath one hour. But often they don't give you a rate. So I have to take my 3.7 feet and make it a fraction. How do I turn a normal number into a fraction? A normal what into what? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. How do I turn a normal number into a fraction? Put a one under it? Yeah, put a one under it. So I've done that. I've taken what they gave me and I've written it as a fraction. So far, I haven't had to make any choices. There's really nothing I could do wrong if I'm having a tired brain time because my brain is shutting down because I'm on a math test or I'm staying up too late. This is a good thing that so far I can't really mess up. Then I want to write some empty rates without numbers. I want to make canceling happen. I have a feet on top and I can only cancel if something is on top and something is on bottom. So my next feet has to be on bottom. Can I change from feet into inches right away? Yes, I know how many feet go into inches. That's my second step. I'm gonna cancel out my feet. What I have left is inches. Inches is what I want. I'm on a roll. And again, I didn't have to make any choices. If I put the feet up top, I would catch myself and say, to cancel something, one has to be on top and one has to be on the bottom. So I would just erase and put my feet on the bottom and put the inches on top. So, so far this is still pretty foolproof and we like foolproof. Then we fill in the numbers. This is where you need to either memorize or write down your conversion rates. How many inches are in a foot or how many feet are in an inch? It's 12 inches and one foot. Next, I'm going to multiply. Multiplying fractions is easy. I multiply across the top, 3.7 times 12. And the only label that's left is inches. And on the bottom, I have one times one. And there's no labels left, it got canceled out. What is 3.7 times 12? 44.4. 44.4, okay.
you'll wind up with a fraction in circa as you multiplied fractions. So the last step is to simplify. I'm going to do top divided by bottom, because that's how we turn fractions into decimals. And in this case, divided by one doesn't change anything. And I get 44.4 .4 inches. Again, we're picking an easy problem to start with. If the denominator wasn't one, then I would actually have to do some division. So there we go, five different steps, but I never had to make any choices. So you never have to worry about, do I multiply by 12 or divide by 12? Oh no, I picked the wrong one or something like that. This guides you through everything by following the process and you get the right answer. Okay, ask me questions about this slide before we move on and do more difficult problems. A question I expect is, wasn't this a lot of work for just times 12? And the answer is yes. If you were someone that did a lot of carpentry and it was something your brain knew very well that to go from feet to inches, I do times 12, then I would not do it this way in real life. There's other ways to do easy measurement problems, but this way lets us reliably do hard measurement problems. So. Let's look at one of those. How many miles per hour is 200 inches per minute? I don't know what I was measuring in inches per minute, maybe how fast my pet moved something like that. Anyway, I'm not good at thinking about speeds in inches per minute. I'm used to thinking about jogging or biking or driving in miles per hour. So I measured something and now I'm thinking, oh, what is this in miles per hour? Because that's how I'm used to thinking about speeds. So we'll do the same steps as before. So first we write things as a fraction. We have 200 inches in one minute. Now I want to make a plan. How do I get from inches and minutes into miles and hours? It doesn't matter whether I start adjusting the inches or the minutes. So somebody shout out, which am I going to deal with first, the inches or the minutes? Would it be the minute? It doesn't matter, we're just picking one. Oh, okay. Sure, minutes. Okay, what does matter is if I have minutes on the bottom, am I gonna put my other minutes on the top or the bottom? On the top, because you're gonna cross cancel? On the top, so I can cancel, yeah. Do I know how to get to hours for minutes? Do I know how many minutes per hour or hours per minute? There's 60 minutes per hour. Yeah, there's 60 minutes in an hour. We know that. So we're good. I can put hours here. We got where we wanted. Ta-da. So the minutes cancel. Oops. Minutes cancel and we're good. We got hours 
we're happy. Okay, now we need to deal with the inches. There's inches in the top. I need to put inches in the bottom. Now, I don't happen to know how many inches are in a mile. Maybe you do, but I'm gonna uh, be me. I don't know that one off the top of my head. I know how many inches are in a foot though. So now my inches have canceled and I'm working with feet. So I need to adjust again. I have feet on top. So my next feet has to be the other one on the bottom. Do I know how many feet are in a mile? Yes, I do. Or if you didn't, you could look it up. Okay, so I will have my feet cancel. And now I have miles per hour. I have finished my step two. I have made my plan. Step three is simply fill in all the numbers that we thought in our head before. 60 minutes in one hour, one foot and 12 inches, one mile is 5,280 feet. If there's any of those you don't know, put them in your notes and you'll have them on homework. Then we multiply. So on the top, we have a 200 times a 60. Now, some people write the ones, some people leave out the ones. If you want to leave out the ones, that's fine. Miles is the only thing at the top. And on the bottom, we have a one times a one and 12 and 5,280. And hours is the only label left on the bottom. So what is that? 200 times 60, or two times six is 12, and there's going to be three zeros. And 12 times 5,280, whatever that is. 63,360. Kind of big numbers, but they're not scary. My calculator is doing all the work. And then we simplify. So we're doing top divided by bottom. And we get about 0.19. So pretty slow. Whatever pet snail I was timing wasn't booking it. This is a tricky enough process that both of these example problems I've done all the way out on the lecture notes, as well as on the Jamboard here. So maybe seeing them in more than one way helps. And this is about as bad as they come, right? I had to do quite a bit of adjusting to get inches and minutes into miles and hours. But throughout the whole thing, I never really had to make choices. Did I divide? Did I multiply? It made all those choices for me. I guess I should be complete and put time symbols here. Did I remember on the other one? I did, okay. Ready to do more of these? Yes. Yes, please. Okay, so we've done a very easy one. It needed only one fidgeting. We did a hard one that needed three fidgetings. So let's do some that are like in between. Uh,
So how many inches is three yards? Okay, I have blue, green, yellow, black, and red. Who wants to do the blue step for me? Three over one. Yeah. And it's important when doing this, always put your labels in. Because if you just put three over one, then you're not sure what to cancel in the next step. So three yards is what they gave me over one. Great. OK, I, next step. What's my green step? What should I do? Our yards. Yeah, we want to get rid of the yards. So where do I put another yards? Um, on the bottom. Can I on the bottom, so they cancel. Let's pretend we don't know how many inches are in a yard, because lots of people don't. What do we normally memorize as going yards to something else? Say that again. What conversion rate and conversion rate do we normally memorize in school? Something is a yard or a yard, this many yards is a something. Feet. Feet. Yeah, what you've probably memorized is three feet is a yard. Okay, I'm not done yet. I have feet progress, but it asks for inches. So I need to keep fidgeting. You got to put feet on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And can I go from feet to the inches I want? Yes, there's 12 inches in one foot. In this problem, I'm showing you that the green and yellow steps you often do at the same time. The only reason they're different steps is in a tricky problem, you might just want to sort of make sure that you get there before you bother to write in the yellow stuff. Because if you made a mistake and put something on the top when it should be on the bottom, then you'd have less erasing. But lots of people will write the yellow and green as the same step, just like we did here. OK, we did it. We're at inches. We're, our goal is there. So we are done. Now we multiply. On top, I have a 3 times 3 times 12. And the only label that's left is inches. On the bottom, I have a 1 times 1 times 1. And there's no label left. 3 times 3 times 12. Well, 9 times 12 is 108. And anything over one for the last answer, top divided by bottom, it's just going to stay 108. Questions on this one? How are people feeling about unit analysis? I'm a little baffled with it. OK. Let's keep doing more of them. Right? Again, this is like riding a bicycle. Can you do this kind of problem without unit analysis? Yes, but it's risky. Right? There's a times 3 or a divided by 3. There's a times 12 or a divided by 12. 
you have to make some choices to try and do it without this process. And if you're making choices, you can do things wrong. Whereas the process, once you learn it, everything flows. Okay, let's get our next one. How many pints is 11 gallons? Oops. Thank you for helping me last time. I will just do one this time. So I have my 11 gallons. I want to make it a fraction. So I put it over one. Do I know how many pints are in a gallon? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. If you don't, then go back to the um, measurement history thing we did. And there's that gallon picture. So pints were eight pints per gallon. Maybe I'll even put this on this one. So one gallon. Oops. Gallons can go into pints, and there's eight pints in one gallon. Gallons will cancel, hooray. And then I multiply 11 times 8 is 88. All that's left is pints. 1 times 1 is 1. 88 over 1 is just 88. So the second part of that multiplication is just turning pints into gallons. Yes, the green ones are always conversion rates. The blue part is what is happening in this problem, right? Only right here do we care about 11 gallons. The rest of the world doesn't care. But everywhere in the world, there's eight pints in a gallon or three feet in a yard or 12 inches in a foot or 5,280 feet in a mile. Right? These are the conversion rates in yellow and green that we just know all the time. Does that clarify what you were thinking? Yes. So the first thing we start with is what's happening in this problem. And then you just sort of toss universal truths at it until it is shaped like you want. Okay. Um, I want to do something with a rate. This one's a homework problem. I'm going to change it so that I'm not doing your homework for you. Instead of 6,500 feet per minute, let's just make it 4,000 feet per minute. So I'm talking to my friend who's a pilot. He says, my plane moves 4,000 feet per minute. And I'm thinking to myself, I have no idea what that is. Let's make it miles per hour so I can see if this plane is going really fast or not. So your turn to help me. What do I start by writing? How many miles are in an hour? How many miles are, if I wanted to kind of collect my facts first, I certainly could. There's 5,280 feet is one mile. 
and 60 minutes is one hour. Most students just sort of have all of this in their notes somewhere, or they have an index card for when they're doing this kind of problem or something like that. And they don't have to write it separately on the top of each problem. But given that we're using a whiteboard, it kind of makes sense. Let's collect all of our facts before we get. Okay, that was a good prologue. How do I start with the first step? Make it a fraction, 4,000 over one. Yeah. And a little bit more than that. What else do I need besides the 4,001? Feet. Feet. And minute. So 4,000 feet per minute. Per is the fraction bar. 4,000 feet per one minute. OK. Now I'm going to make some fractions. I want to get rid of feet. There's one up there, so let's put one down here. Can I go from feet to miles? Yes, I have that. I don't want miles per minute. I want miles per hour. So I have to keep adding more fractions. I want to get rid of this minute. So let's put minutes up top as it was on the bottom. Can we go from minutes to hours? Yes, we know that one. Now I have my plan, the part that is this problem and the part that's just universal truths about how measurement units are defined. So I'm at the multiplying step. So 4,000 times 1 times 60. That's going to be a 4 times 6 is 24 with four zeros after it. And the only label that's left on top is miles. And 1 times 5,000 times 280 times one, all the times ones don't change it. It stays 5,280. And the only label that's left on the bottom is hours. Then lastly, I do top divided by bottom. And I get an answer that I'm expecting will be rounding. And it's about 45 miles per hour. At this point, I hope my friend is taking off or landing and not that says cruising speed because that's pretty slow for this plane. Questions about this slide? No. Um, let's do another one. Somebody drinks 12 cups of coffee a day. My goodness. How many gallons per year would that be? Do I know? Let's collect our numbers at the top. That was a smart idea. Do I know how many cups are in a gallon? Sixteen. 
16. Okay, so 16 cups equals one gallon. Do I know how many days are in a year? Sure, 365. So I have my preparations. I'm organized. I'm ready to do my conversion rates when I need them. Okay, let's get started then. So 12 cups every one day. His poor bladder. Doesn't matter what I with to what the cups or the days first. No right in. Yesterday. Cups. Cups. Okay. This cups is on top. So the other cups has to be on bottom. And cups I can make into gallons. Cups will cancel. I might as well write in right now. One gallon is 16 cups. Okay. So far, so good. But I don't want gallons per day. I need to get rid of that day. So let's keep going. I have a day on the bottom. The other day has to be on top. Can I go right from days to years? Sure, I know that. My days cancel out. And 365 days is one year. Everyone okay with steps two and three? Yep. Now I multiply across, across the top, 12 times one times 365. So 4,380. And the only label that's left is the gallons I wanted. On the bottom, one times 16 times one is 16. And the only label that's left is the years that I want. Then finally, top divided by. And I get about 274 gallons per year. Ready to do one all by yourself? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's just do I'm almost freezing. With a different number. Oh, 23 is good. No, I'm not done. I'm just cold. About ten. Yeah. Okay, so yes, baby, stop. Coffee lover truck drinks 10 cups of coffee each day. How many gallons per year is this? So write that much down, and then I'll go back to the other slide so you can look at that while you work.
Okay, everyone has 10 cups per day. So work on that one and then shout out when you're done or type your answer in chat or something like that. And we'll see if we all agree. Are we supposed to share our answer once we're done? I think you were on mute. Sorry, I was on mute, yeah because I have kids too. Um, yeah, just say when you're done or put something in chat with the answer so I know that I should start work <laughs> see if we're all on the same page. Uh, 
Are you ready for me? I should have paused the recording so we don't bore everyone at home, but that's okay. Okay, if you've done this, where do we start? By the way, your answer should have been about 228. So if you got that, you can be confident that you're giving me good advice. Sweet, okay. In that case, I will, uh, I'll do it. Okay. Go ahead and start off with 10 cups in one day. 10 cups per one day. Per one day. Uh, fraction bars is per, if that helps you. Okay, that's my blue step. Your choice, are we dealing with cups or day first? Uh, we'll deal with the cups. Okay, so cups was on top. So there is 16 cups and one gallon or one gallon. So one gallon over 16 cups. Okay. One gallon over 16 cups. And you did that. So cups was on the bottom and on the top so they could cancel with each other. But now we need to deal with the days. Okay. Days is on the bottom. So would it be 365 days on top in one year? And again, if you had picked it wrong and put the 365 on the bottom or something, you would start canceling and say, oh, they're on the same part. They're both on the bottom. I have to switch it. Right? So if you make a mistake, it will self-correct. I need a day on the bottom and a day on the top so they can cancel. And that tells me where to put my numbers. And you would put uh, 3,650 gallons on top. Oops, I can write correctly. The only word left is gallons. And then 16. And the only word year. left is years. So it even gives you a double check at this point. I'm asking for gallons per year. I have gallons per year. Life is good. And that would equal roughly 228 gallons per year. Okay. So for the however many time I've told you tonight, then do enough of these that the process gets nice and smooth. It's a long process. Five steps is a lot. It takes a little bit of preparation if you don't have your measurement conversion rates handy or memorized. But once you get used to it, it flows very nicely. And since you don't have to make choices, then you won't make silly mistakes. So it's a nice, reliable way to do a pretty tricky kind of math problem. So you have a weekend until I see you on Tuesday. Hopefully you have time to get this under your belt. And compared to some things, then you might want to actually do this for like 20 or 30 minutes in one sitting so that it gets into your brain better rather than try and fit it in just while doing lunch and then a little here and so on. I'm not sure how many people try math homework piecemeal. Okay, we do have more time. So I think we should go on to polygons and circles. 
we could take a little break if people need for dinner and warming up their drinks and things, or we could keep going till 7.50 or eight and then take a break and then have like work on homework together as after the break. You want more of a lectured new stuff class app, or do we want just a little bit more and then take a break and work on problems? Just a little bit more on homework. Okay, that's Joel's vote. We, we tried that on Tuesday, lots of people were tired and just left. Uh, the rest oh. of us had a good time, but if we're all exhausted, then that might not be the best one. Will other people stick around and work on homework together if we just do like one of these? I'm good with whatever. Good with whatever. Okay, well, let's not do too much then. We'll just do a little bit more of new stuff and then stop. And what this will do is when we get to the 10 exercises, then there's only one of them that involves a circle. So you can do nine out of 10 over the weekend if you're the kind of person that your schedule fits most of your homework on the weekends. So polygons will be our last topic. And this is a relaxing topic. It's stuff that's review for a lot of students. It's a lot of definitions and there's not much to it the first time we look at this. Um, unfortunately, this works much better if you were sitting in a room with me and I could give you pieces of paper. So I'm gonna have to just um, use the pictures on the screen, but I encourage you after class or if you're watching the video, then when I do something with shapes and folding and cutting, then pause the video or watch it again and pause the video and actually get a rectangular piece of paper, like an eight and a half by 11 cut into two longer rectangles, what my younger kids call hot dog folding. Um, and then try it with folding and scissors and see how this works in your hands. If you're a kinesthetic learner, then I can't really give you that on Zoom, but you can do it yourself. Well, let's get started. So if I'm wondering how big something is, then I can talk about perimeter and area as two different ways to measure how big something is. Perimeter is how far a distance goes around the edges. So if I have a shape and I want to find the perimeter, then I pretend I'm an ant and I walk around it. So perimeter is something that you often would want to measure with string. I'm going to be an ant and pick one corner to start at and walk around the edges. Doodly 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 doo. And then I get back to the beginning and I wonder how far did I walk? I could take my black line as a string and straighten it out and put it next to a ruler or a yardstick and see how far I walked. About the only thing that people do wrong on perimeter problems on tests is they might forget a side. Maybe something happens where you get this far and then you stop too early. Or maybe something happens where you kind of you start here and you go around and then you double count one side and wind up here at the end or something like that because we all make silly mistakes on math tests. So I encourage you to do what I did and actually mark a circle when you start. Remind yourself which corner you start at because doing a distance that's not one lap is about the only way you mess this up. Area is a very different creature. Area is how much shape the surface takes up. So now I am somebody that has a can of paint and a paintbrush, 
and I want to paint my thing. So the kind of answer is different. This isn't something like feet or inches that you would measure with string next to a ruler. Instead, it's how much paint do I use up? Okay, so far? Yep. Ah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Shapes are fun with kids. Polygons, our last definition, are closed shapes whose edges are straight lines. So a bunch of them you know, squares, rectangles, triangles, the blue one that looks like an elephant set on a rectangle, that's a parallelogram because opposite edges are parallel. And the red one that looks like a slanty pyramid with the top chopped off, that's a trapezoid. So for the first challenge, let's draw a polygon with seven edges. So there's no right answer. There's lots of polygons with seven edges. So I will just like, here's an edge, and there's an edge, and there's an edge. Now I'm at three, four, five, six, seven. There we go. My lines aren't perfectly straight because my art is not great, but assume that these actually had seven straight lines. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and it's closed, meaning that all the corners close in together and make something that's, you know, I'll put a sheep in the outside, it won't escape. And all the edges are lines. If we want to draw a shape with four edges that's not a polygon, then we can do that. We either need to not close it. So one, two, three, four. There's a shape with four edges that's not a polygon because it doesn't come back where it started. Or we could take three edges and then put something that's not a straight line. Or we could do something that's like totally crazy. Right? Do, 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 do. So here's one that's not a straight line and it's not closed, something like that. So that's what polygons are. Perimeter, again, we just walk around the edge like an ant and add up all the distances. You know how to add things up. Mark one corner so you don't carelessly forget it. So let's find the perimeter of these two things. Tell me for the red one, what numbers am I adding up? Three, five, or four? Yeah. It doesn't matter what order you rate them at all. You could go around it this way or that way, like clockwise, counterclockwise. We add them all up and we get uh, eight, 12 inches. For the blue one, this is a rectangle and they've only labeled two of the sides. They're trying to trick us. How, what is the distance of this side over here? Three inches. Three inches, because it's the same as the opposite. And then how far is the bottom? It's going to be the same as the top. So I can add all those up. And they get what, 12.2, 15, 18.2, if I did my mental math right. So 
some people want to be fancy and they will go halfway around a rectangle and then double it knowing that the other half is going to be the same. That works too. Can we make that tricky? Sure. Let's do, oops, actually I want to, pardon me as I go with my screen, make that not so wide. I want to do it on the other side. So this problem is trying to trick us. We have another rectangle and its sides are, it's not gonna be actually that extreme. Oh, okay. 2.5 feet on the long side. And 20 inches on the short side. So why am I in trouble to start with? It doesn't work to just add these all up and get 45. I think you need to change the feet into inches. Yeah, they don't match. The measurement units all need to match so I can add them up. Just like with fraction denominators, right? We can only add if we're counting inches or oranges or feet or umbrellas or whatever it is. We have to be counting the same thing, the whole problem. Now I could change inches to feet, but it wants inches. So Emily is right. Let's change the feet to inches so our answer has the units it asks for. So I will get rid of 2.5 feet. If we want to, we could do unit analysis just to review that since we did it earlier. There might be a quicker way for you to do this, but 2.5 feet. Put it over one. Can I go from feet to inches? Sure. There's 12 inches in a foot. Feet cancel. 2.5 times 12 would be 24 and 6. So that's going to be 30 inches. And the over one doesn't do anything. So do that out longer if you want. But this is 30 inches. Then I can add it up. Maybe start here and go that way. So 30 plus 20 plus another 30 plus another 20 is 100 inches. And I am curious in my lecture notes, did I draw a picture? No, I did not. Okay. But except for that, when someone is really mean and gives you two different measurement units, then perimeter problems are easy. You're just adding up the numbers. I suppose we could also be tricky in saying, here are some unlabeled sides. So look at that one when you are looking at things after um, lecture and see if you can do this one. It tells you the answers here. So. Okay, area is different. We have area is length times width. And why does that make sense? Four times two is eight. We've seen this before when we were making pictures for multiplying fractions that if I have four feet on one side and two feet on the other, I get eight boxes. But I want to talk about this a little bit more while also looking at this slide here. So there were a few ways when people think about area that they could have defined how much paint to use up. And what they decided on was we should take our shape and draw boxes 
and count how many boxes it takes to cover the shape. And that works great if you have a nice shape that's you know, a square or a rectangle. But if I have this trapezoid, then there's going to be like spaces that hang out over the edge. It's not going to work perfect. So it's a, a slightly um, philosophical thing that we are saying this shape uses as much paint as something that had nice boxes. And that's what I will say about the square feet feet that are one foot on each side. How many square feet does it take to cover this? It's not going to work exactly because some squares will have extra little bits, but I could use the same amount of paint on something that was a rectangle and get an answer. Okay, continuing our lecture. So area is length times width. That's something you can memorize if you need to, but it's not really a why kind of thing. It's just how we're defining area. We're defining area as how many square feet of paint it takes to paint this rectangle. How about a triangle? We'll first look at the kind of triangle that has a straight up and down edge. How many square feet would it take to paint this triangle. And what can I do to make this triangle into a rectangle so I could paint it? Add another triangle. Yeah, if I draw the other kind of missing thing, these two triangles are the same, right? So if I want to know how much paint it takes for the first triangle, then I could paint the whole thing, which is twice as much as I want, and then take half of it. So for some annoying reason, traditionally, we don't say that this is length and width and say that our green area is half of length times width. Again, of means times. And that would be too easy and too much like a rectangle. And instead, people sort of hide the fact that this triangle used to be a rectangle, or if it's not, we made it a rectangle. And they will use the formula I'm going to write it over here. Area is one half base times height, which is probably what you've been made to memorize before. Don't ask me why I wasn't there, but for some reason, when we talk about triangles, then we change the words we use. And instead of length and width, we use base and height. But that's all the formula is saying, is we made a rectangle out of this. We painted the whole rectangle. And then we just looked at half of it to see how much was the original triangle. So far, so good? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So. I'm being wimpy. I'm using this great kind of triangle that obviously looks like half of a rectangle. What about this creature? Is the same thing going to work? Can I make this into half of a rectangle? No. Joel gives up too early. You can. What can we do? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'll give you a hint. A dotted line. That's a terrible dotted line. It looks like mascara is one. Uh, 
that's not much better. I'll give you another hint. What if we had sort of a blue side of this rectangle and a red side of this rectangle? Well, I'll give you another hint. The blue one, you already did. Okay, if you're watching the video, pause. I'm about to give it away. So if I draw my rectangle here, then this blue part, oops, let me make it highlight. This blue part is duplicated here. Those are the same size. And this red part is duplicated here. Those are the same size. So my original triangle is still half of that big rectangle. That means that if I'm looking at length, oops, and width, then the things I rename base and height I can rename the bottom, the base, but when I rename the width to be height, I'm going to be talking about this dashed line going up and down to the tallest part of the triangle from the base straight up. So the sides that are not the base don't matter. They are not part of this formula because they aren't anywhere in my black rectangle. Whereas my bottom side of the rectangle is the base of the triangle. And the left or right side of my rectangle is this part of the triangle from the top straight down to the bottom. But it's still true that my area for a tr this triangle is one half of base times height. And I'm going to start using my personal notation and say this is the area of a triangle with a little subscript. Just because if I'm doing lots of area problems, then sometimes my brain decides to try and trip me up and put the wrong formula. So this is the area of a triangle formula So I'm not confusing myself if I'm doing other shapes on the same page. Okay, and you can see that happening here. If we were taking papers and scissors in the classroom, we could actually cut off the little wing on the top right and move it over and say, look, they're the same. For parallelograms, we're going to do the same thing. We can cut off this wing and move it to the other side and turn this parallelogram into a rectangle. So it's just like what we did before, before with the second triangle. I'm going to say that the height of a parallelogram is not the slanty edges because they aren't anywhere in the rectangle that I get. And I can only fill up rectangles with paint to get square units. 
So I'm going to have the length or the base, whatever you want to call it. Most books will call it the base. And then this dotted line will be the width of the rectangle, which we're probably going to rename a height. And I will write that the area of a parallelogram is all of base times height. because I'm getting all of this rectangle instead of just half of it, because I had to photocopy my triangle to fill in the blanks before. Okay, so far? Yep. I'm good here. To do what? There's one more, the trapezoid, and that's really not gonna work over Zoom. There is a hint but I encourage you after class to get a piece of paper, make it sort of a longer thin rectangle, hold your paper hot dog style and cut it in half and play around with this and see if you can make the trapezoid into something. Um, and if not, look at the time. We can start tomorrow with this review where we have these shapes on paper and if you want, you could even print this out and physically cut these apart and see how they work. But this will be our review tomorrow. But rewards are done. We have some videos. We have textbook, including section one point something. You know, chapter one, section two. These are ones you can do for free without a code. Um, so now you can get to the 10 exercises and do almost everything, all but number 10. Uh, I guess the trapezoid one, you'd have to look up the formula up above, but you can do that. So if you need to start homework over the weekend, because once Tuesday happens, you'll have no free time, you can actually get all of the mad science homework done now. So let's take a little break. We can do some homework until 8.20ish. How about just a five minute break since it's already 8.05, 8.06. I'll see you soon. If you need to go, that's fine. And then we can do some homework together too. Okay, homework question after our break. Somebody loaded up a mad science review test going to the bottom of the mad science. And we're looking at number six. And this was about order of operations and terms. We would find all the plus and minus signs outside of parentheses. And then those tell us how this breaks up into terms. There's a term, there's a term, there's a term, and there's a term. And these four terms are separate. So now they're like smaller targets. We can use PEMDAS to approach each of these separately, and it's not so overwhelming. The plus and minus is just gonna keep going. So in this term, five times stuff, okay. Am I going to do the addition or the multiplying first in the parentheses? Multiplying. Multiplying. And either you're thinking that because multiplying and division come before addition and subtraction. Remember, those are like two groups. Or maybe you are thinking that this is one term inside the parentheses, and this is another term inside the parentheses. It's the same thinking. Anyway, but yes, we do the 20 times six first. So this is going to be six plus 120. So now we have five times six plus 120 is 126. Then I will do that on my calculator because I don't trust my mental math at this hour and I get 630. So we've taken the first term and simplified it. 
And this was beautiful. We didn't have to worry about all this other stuff. Okay, the 12, it's just a 12. It's hanging out, waiting for other things to get equally simple. And the eight, it's just an eight, hanging out, waiting for us to be ready for it. Okay, last term. We're going to start with parentheses. There aren't any. There's exponents though. So 81 divided by three times three is nine. And two times two times two is eight. If you needed to write those out, then three times three equals nine. And two times two times two, we have three twos is four times two, which is eight. Then 81 divided by nine, I'm going left to right because I'm only doing multiplication and division and they're the same kind of order. So 81 divided by nine is nine and nine times eight is 72. And as one last step, I'll actually do all the plus and minus. I have 630. If I do plus 12 minus eight, that's the same as plus four. I'm up to 634. And then if I do plus 70, I'm up to 704. And then two more is 706, if I did all my mental math right. Questions while that's on the board? Okay, questions about something else from the random test. Should we do 19, review the perimeter and area we just talked about? We never really had time for example problems. We can do that, sounds good. Make it smaller so it copies and pastes better. So that's the new jam board, so. Back to the first page and erase it. Come on, internet. There we go. Okay. So a right triangle. That just means the kind that goes up and down on one edge. And by tradition, they're drawn where the up and down is on the right side. A right triangle has sides of 10, 24, and 26 centimeters. So which side is obviously the small one? Where am I going to put my 10 on my picture? The smaller side? Yeah. That one. And this is slightly tricky. Which is longer? This one here that's diagonal or the base? I'm obviously going to chase the bravest one. I am I'm chase the bravest one. Will the diagonal be 26? Yes, the diagonal is always a little longer than the base. So 
So now that I have these on my picture, I can say, aha, I'm going to get rid of this one. That's a distraction. My formulas only care about base and height, about length and width. So any other number doesn't matter to me. So that's why we drew the picture. It wasn't really that we had to know it's a triangle. It told us it's a triangle. But the picture helped us remember when you give me the sides of a right triangle, the longest one doesn't matter. That's the diagonal not relevant. At least not relevant for area. I'm speaking too soon. I forgot. This one asked for perimeter. I had area on my brain. OK, so perimeter. The perimeter, it does matter. Of course, we have to walk all the way around as an ant. So I'm just going to pick a corner, maybe this one, and walk all the way around. So I do need that 26. And then we'll go down the 10. And then we'll go over the 24. And what is that? 40, 50, 60 centimeters. And then for the area, use my formula. Area is 1 half area for a triangle is 1 half times base times height. If you are someone that uses B and H, great. Lots of people take the 1 half and make it a 0.5 because that's easier on the calculator, right? So my base is 24, my height is 10, and that's going to be half of 24 is 12 times 10 is 120, and then it's labeled square centimeters. Oops, and that should be an equal sign, not a Questions about that one? I don't know if I missed it, but where did we get the 0 0.5 from? That's the 1 half. People will often switch it to the 0 0.5 just because it fits in your calculator better than a 1 half. OK, thank you. OK, one more, then I need to have dinner with my family. Ignore 13, by the way. I should take that one out because we moved simple interest to a different big topic page. Well, if you're not going to pick one, I will. Let's do 18. So a square has a perimeter of 160 feet. I'll draw my square. How long is each side? Side and dinner.
Is each side uh, 91 feet? 91. It's 160 to go all the way around. How did you get 91? Oh, wait, hold on. I think I'm looking at something else. Oh. It's a square. So all four sides are going to be the same. Would it be 40? It is. How did you get that? Would it be 160 divided by the four sides? Yeah. No. <laughs> If four things make 160 and they're all the same, then how do I say four equal parts? It's divided by four. I shouldn't put a box, box around it though. That's not really my answer. So each side is 40. I'll label that. Now, how do I find the area? Area of a square is length times width or base times height, whatever you want to use. Oops, and I can spell. Bye bye, Sharon. So 40 times 40. So four times four is 16, now with two zeros after it. And that's all for now. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.